Straight up ahead, do you see the white flagpole? That is our Liberty Pole. Now, now, here's the story of the Liberty Pole. The King put in a, a tax for, or the Parliament put in a tax for the Stamp Act. The King repealed it. We loved him. We basically said we're going to erect the Liberty Pole um, and we're going to put in honor of the King on his birthday and we're also going to build him a statue. It took a while for us to get the money to build the statue, but eventually we built a statue for him all the way down in Bowling Green Park. He's on top of a horse, gilded in gold. It's the most beautiful thing in the world. But because the Liberty Pole became the focus ground for the Sons of Liberty, for us to come and to stage uh, protests, to talk about the problems that were going on, uh, the British who were garrisoned here, they chopped it down. Two days later, this is right in 76, basically uh, the very beginning, um, oh, I'm sorry, in 66, the, right when the Stamp Act happened. We put up another one. They chopped that one down. We put up a third one. We went to the governor and we basically said, these are very important to us. Boston has a Liberty Tree. We don't have a tree. We created a pole. We want this pole to stay. And so he put out the word. They, we're taking this seriously, do not cut down our Liberty Pole. And they left that one standing for two and a half years. Two and a half years later, the, uh, finally the New York legislature, uh, led by those Clintonians, they decided to then give the money to the British for the Quartering Act. Uh, and so we, uh, the uh, Sons, of the, uh, Sons of the Revolution, uh, the Patriots, we basically did not like this. And so we came here to protest and they chop down our Liberty Pole. So we then erected the fourth one with bands around it, bands of metal. Good luck trying to chop that one down. Um, so now it's interesting to note where we are and because this actually changes the scope of America. Right around the common are a lot of taverns. Just similar if you went up to Lexington Green um, there's a lot of taverns around there with the uh, Lexington and Concord battles in 75. So we, the tavern that I like to hang out at uh, was Montaigne's. This is where the Sons of the Revolution, where we would coalesce. Now that's just basically on the very southern tip, slightly to the left. And that was one of our hangouts. There was a couple more taverns there. And so when the British actually came to, they could not saw it down, but came to blow it up with gunpowder, we found out about this. And this is now in 69. So I'm hearing about this story from my mentor, Alexander McDougall. And he's telling me that this is the creation of America. Everyone thinks it's Boston with the Boston Massacre, but the very first people ever to shed blood for the cause of the revolution happened here in the Battle of Golden Hill. The British couldn't blow it up. We actually went outside the taverns going like, what are they doing? They're trying to blow it up. We were making fun of them. They didn't take kindly to that. They basically arrested two of our friends. They brought them into the tavern and they basically trashed the tavern. They beat up a waiter. It was atrocious. Imagine the police doing this, going into a Starbucks and just beating people up and trashing the area. This is not right. We wrote a broadside to this effect, basically saying how the soldiers are the enemy to the peace of the people. So you're looking at the very beginning between the schism, between the crown, their authority, and the people. They try, um, so after that, uh, they did eventually blow it up another day. And after blowing it up, just to add insult to injury, they took the pieces, brought it down to the tavern, and basically laid it at the doorstep for us to see the next day. We then, upon uh, Alexander McDougall, put up the broadside declaring that all soldiers were now the enemy to the peace of the people. They then were putting up broadsides, basically declaring that our affinity for Poles make us, you know, crazy, for lack of a better word, that we put so much faith inside of a pole. It's a piece of, it's a twig. Why, you know, what type of people are we? We arrested them, the two soldiers that were putting up these placards. We brought them on down to City Hall. And it was at this point that they were screaming and kicking. I mean, we're arresting them. We're taking them by force. 20 more of their soldiers come out. They start confronting us. We go down to the governor at City Hall. We basically present our case. The governor says, yes, I'll take care of it. Um, but now more soldiers have come. There's about 60 soldiers now. And they blocked the, our front way and blocked our back way. And now we're heading to leave.
and I want to read to you a little bit of the unknown history of New York, the first-hand account of the battle which is more important than Lexington or Boston. Those few that had sticks, meaning the people, maintained their ground in the narrow passage in which they stood and defended their defenseless fellow citizens against the furious and unmanly attacks of armed soldiers, until one of them, in a stroke made at one of the assailants, lost his stick, which obliged the former to retreat. The soldiers pursued him down the main street. One of them made a stroke with a cutlass, which is a sword, at Mr. Francis Field, st uh, standing in an inoffensive posture at the doorway at a corner, and cut him in the right cheek. The first man to feel the blow of the American Revolution, Mr. Francis Field. This partly came down to the main street, uh, where they cut a tea water man driving his cart. In short, they madly attacked every person that they could reach. Besides cutting a sailor's head and finger, they stabbed another with a bayonet so badly that his life was thought in danger. Now, mind you, a bayonet is an illegal weapon. A bayonet actually creates a tricorn wound, similar to my hat, that does not heal like a regular knife would. It's now been illegal. Uh, to use this weapon in the entirety of the world. Two of them followed a boy going for sugar into Mrs. Mr. Ellsworth's house. One of them cut him on the head with a cutlass, and the other made a lunge with a bayonet at the woman in the entry. Captain Richardson was violently attacked by two of the soldiers with swords and expected to have been cut to pieces, but was fortunate to defend himself with a stick for a considerable time, till a halberd was put in his hand, with which he could have killed several of them, but he made no other use of it other than to defend himself and his naked citizens. The order was, soldiers, draw your bayonets and cut your way through them. Now this story was related to me by Alexander MacDougall. And it was then a couple of years later, I arrived in December of 73, in the summer of 74, I'm standing next to McDougal, talking to New Yorkers for the first time with this story in my heart to really push me into the politics of the day. And now I am standing uh, defending the king to the people, but also our rights as Englishmen. And that happened right here as well. What, what year was that? Uh, 74, July of 74. And then after that, uh, then came some of the pamphlets that I wrote. Uh, a, uh, a farmer refuted and a full vindication for the rights, which I also stood up after the pamphlets being publicized and put out. I also stood up to, uh, to proclaim the rights, uh, the ideas that were inside of them. At one point, uh, contradicting Samuel Seabury, for those of you who saw the, um, saw the musical, right. he features prominently in it as well.